Andy Roman here. Welcome to episode 26. Today I'm going to talk about anxiety. It's a difficult topic in a way, but I tell you, if you've ever seen somebody or been somebody in the throes of high anxiety, you know how all-consuming it can be. I recently worked with a client who was over-the-top anxious. Uh, it's like watching somebody in a manic state where on one level it's entertaining because it's so it's so odd, but on the other, there's such a high level of fear and suffering. My definition of anxiety goes like this. It's a future-oriented fear based on the past. And that means its strategy is to focus on what's wrong and what's potentially dangerous. So there's a high level of vigilance in it and a high level of negativity. The brain is wired to anticipate things that can go wrong, but in an anxious state, it's over the top. It's everything is wrong, which is reminiscent of the epidemic of not good enough that's going on in our culture, in our world today. And a highly anxious state is that squared. I mean, it takes that to the next level. At the highest level of anxiety, a subpersonality tends to emerge that I call the tormentor. The tormentor has fine-tuned the focus on what's wrong and the negative to the degree where it can see it and find it everywhere. It's nonstop. It's like a black hole. You know, there isn't a single person that can withstand the forces of the tormentor. And that's why it does take a village to really work with somebody who is in a highly anxious state. There is a woman, um, let me see if I can remember her name. Her name is Peggy Claude Pierre. She's written a book called The Secret Language of Eating Disorders. And she has created a clinic in Montreal that has a very, very high success rate with eating disorders. And she is the one who really, where I learned this tormentor thing from. Um, and her approach with her history, she herself was anorexic and bulimic as a younger person, and then grew up to have two daughters who were also both anorexic and bulimic. Her clinic strategy is this, love them, keep loving them. There's somebody with the patient 24 hours a day there to counter the voice of the tormentor. Not by disputing the feelings, but simply by overriding the negativity with love. It sounds a little California. It sounds a little woo-woo. You know, love is the cure. But I tell you, love is the cure. Consciousness is the cure. The thing that um, also works is when a person can start recognizing the tormentor and identifying it as such. Once you got it labeled, once you can recognize it, you can call it out and actually counter it. And my counsel to the person then is, what would a good friend say to you? When the tormentor says this, what would a good friend say to you to counter that? That has been so successful because once a person finds that resource of the good friend, the tormentor is on its way out. You know, and just like everything that I've talked about in this series and in my books, it is important to have your feelings and not be had by them in the same way. It's important to have your anxiety and not be had by it. That means to face it and feel it, let it wash over you, learn how to identify the tormentor, cultivate and discover that inner best friend that will just love you out of it and until you get there, Enroll your community, enroll your tribe to, to be that loving voice for you, that accepting um, presence. I, I noticed that my client, who was really highly anxious, was unable to do anything. It was the classic paralysis by analysis and just paralysis, period, um, and her rationale, I finally helped her water it down to this. Until I figure out a safe future for myself, I can't let myself do anything. And that is so counterproductive 
because that's just not going to happen in that sequence. The sequence that works is pick some actions and take some actions that you know are good for you and then just do them. If you're going to be anxious no matter what you do, you might as well do some good things because the odds are that you will have some kind of a breakthrough in positivity that, oh, I actually was able to do something for for myself. And that increases the probability of discovering that friend reality within. It's a resource. I actually, oh, I actually can love myself and do good things for myself. So it takes a lot. I also want to talk about what I consider the pre-verbal levels or the body level of anxiety. Because a lot of times anxiety can be imprinted when we're very young. In my own case, this is some personal sharing, but my mother was a Holocaust survivor who in hiding in basements in World War II, Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia, experienced a lot of warranted fear. And you could say anxiety because her future was completely uncertain and her present was dangerous. She experienced a lot of loss also. Interestingly enough, I'm named after her brother who was shot to death in a labor camp. And so I believe that I was exposed to her anxiety from a very early age. And I noticed that that imprint up until even recently, I didn't really know to the full extent that that wasn't mine. I experienced it as my own anxiety, when really it was hers imprinted in my nervous system. And I've just had to find and practice a lot of love for that little baby part of me who just innocently absorbed all that stuff. And so that nonverbal or preverbal level of dealing with anxiety really included letting it wash over me, letting it be there, knowing myself, my true self well enough to recognize, you know what, that's not me. And I don't have to identify with it anymore. And I can actually let it pass through as the not me that it always was. I hope this has been helpful to help you identify some features of anxiety. You know, anxiety in the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, where all the diagnoses, mental health diagnoses are, takes up a large portion of the human pathology, mental illness. So it behooves us to really know about anxiety and to take some humanistic steps. Because to take anti-anxiety medicine really just makes those imprints go deeper inside. It makes them seem like they're wrong, like you have to get rid of your feelings. And that's just a dangerous approach. I've said that in other sections of this, Get Real with Andy. And I'm saying it again. Get rid of feelings isn't a viable approach. We didn't make these things up. It's part of the human design. And it just behooves us to learn how to navigate it wisely and intelligently. The future is not ours to see. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but it is ours to embrace. And I tell you, when you feel good in the present, when there is self-knowledge about what is, then you know what will be. It's just better. And that's the, that's the ultimate antidote. It's the loving friend that Rumi talked about, you know, not just part of our own psyche or personality as a resource, but the universal dear friend that comes with good news and helps us bring in a, a, a better and livable future for ourselves. All right. Thank you. Love you.